You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Struggling to secure on prem apps with modern identity? Don't worry, you're not alone. Join industry leaders from Fortune 500 organizations to secure your apps on any cloud with any IDP, regardless of your environment's complexity. Meet Strata's identity orchestration platform, Mavericks. Say goodbye to the headaches of app refactoring and legacy tech debt. With identity orchestration, you can modernize legacy apps to use MFA or passwordless authentication in a few weeks, migrate from one IDP to another, and so much more without changing the app. No matter your IAM use case, Strata extends the value of your current identity investments. And the best part? You can try it for free today. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire to share your biggest identity challenge, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. Lockbit claims to have hit the Federal Reserve. CDK Global negotiates with Black Suit to unlock car dealerships across the U.S. Treasury proposes a rule to restrict tech investments in China. An L.A. school district confirms a snowflake-related data breach. Raphael Rat hits outdated Android devices. The U.K.'s largest plutonium stockpiler pleads guilty to criminal charges of inadequate cybersecurity. Clearview AI settles privacy violations in a deal that could exceed $50 million. North Korean hackers target aerospace and defense firms. Rick Howard previews CSOP Live. Our guest is Christy Terrell, Chief Information Security Officer at Bishop Fox, discussing how organizations can best leverage offensive security tactics. And bug hunting gets a little too real. It's Monday, June 24th, 2024. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is your CyberWire Intel Briefing. Happy Monday, and thank you for joining us. It is great, as always, to have you here with us. The Lockbit Ransomware Group claims to have breached the U.S. Federal Reserve, stealing 33 terabytes of sensitive data, including Americans' banking information. They added the Federal Reserve to their Tor data leak site and threatened to release the data on June 25th. No sample data has been published yet. Lockbit's announcement detailed the Federal Reserve's role in managing money distribution across 12 banking districts in cities like New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. They mocked the negotiator handling the situation, calling them a clinical idiot, demanding a replacement within 48 hours. Experts are skeptical, suspecting the announcement may be a ploy for attention given the Federal Reserve's high-profile status. If true, a breach of this magnitude could, of course, have significant consequences. The Federal Reserve has yet to comment, and of course there's a good chance that this is nothing more than bluster and bravado from the Lockbit gang. HelpNet Security commented on the recent string of threat actors making false claims. Hackers sell fake data primarily for financial gain, similar to peddling fake jewelry. Other motives include gaining notoriety, creating distractions, damaging reputations, manipulating stock prices, and uncovering security processes. For example, in March of this year, a Russian hacking group falsely claimed to hack Epic Games to gain visibility. Similarly, false breach claims like the one against Sony in September of last year can harm reputations despite being untrue. Hackers can use tools like ChatGPT to generate convincing fake data. Organizations can combat fake breaches by monitoring the dark web, analyzing leaked data sets, preparing their workforce, keeping communication teams ready, deploying canary tokens, and using integrated security models like SASE to detect and block breaches in real time. 
Car dealerships across North America were thrown into chaos after CDK Global suffered a massive IT outage caused by the Black Suit ransomware gang. This disruption forced dealerships to revert to pen and paper for operations, impacting sales, inventory, and customer service. Major dealership groups like Penske Automotive and Sonic Automotive reported significant disruptions and implemented manual workarounds. The Black Suit ransomware gang is behind the attack, according to anonymous sources. CDK Global is negotiating with the gang to obtain a decryptor and prevent data leaks. The attack forced CDK to shut down its IT systems twice to contain the damage. Black Suit, which emerged in May 2023, is believed to be a rebrand of the Royal Ransomware Operation. The FBI and CISA have linked them to over 350 attacks and $275 million in ransom demands since September of 2022. CDK also warned of threat actors posing as its agents to gain unauthorized access. The Treasury Department proposed a rule to restrict and monitor U.S. investments in China for AI, computer chips, and quantum computing, based on President Biden's August 2023 executive order. This aims to prevent countries of concern, including China, Hong Kong, and Macau, from enhancing their military and cyber capabilities with U.S. funds. The rule requires U.S. citizens and residents to report transactions in these areas, and prohibits funding AI systems for military applications in China. President Biden also imposed tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, highlighting political efforts to counter China. Treasury seeks public comments on the proposal until August 4th, with a final rule expected afterward. Despite rising tensions, officials assert no intent to decouple from China. The Los Angeles Unified School District confirmed a data breach after threat actors accessed its Snowflake account, stealing student and employee information. Snowflake is a cloud database platform used globally. Hackers began selling data from several companies, including the Los Angeles Unified School District, on hacker forums. A joint investigation by Snowflake, Mandiant, and CrowdStrike revealed that the threat actor, UNC5537, exploited stolen credentials from organizations who weren't using multi-factor authentication, downloaded their data, and attempted extortion. On June 18th, the hacker Spider listed LAUSD data for $150,000. Another hacker, Satanic, had earlier sold different LAUSD data. LAUSD is working with the FBI and CISA to investigate Students, teachers, and staff should stay vigilant against potential phishing attacks using this leaked data. The open-source Android malware Rafael Rat is being widely used by cybercriminals to attack outdated devices, often deploying a ransomware module demanding payment via Telegram. Researchers at Checkpoint detected over 120 campaigns using Rafael Rat, including those by known threat actors like APT C-35, originating from Iran and Pakistan. High-profile organizations in the government and military sectors, mainly in the U.S., China, and Indonesia, are among the targets. Most victims run Android versions 11 or older, which are no longer receiving security updates. Rafael Rat spreads through fake apps mimicking popular brands, and requests risky permissions during installation. It supports various commands, including ransomware and device lock. To defend against these attacks, users should avoid dubious APK downloads, avoid clicking on suspicious URLs, and use Play Protect. Sellafield Limited, the organization that manages the world's largest plutonium stockpile, has pleaded guilty to all charges related to cybersecurity failings from 2019 to 2023. The UK's Office for Nuclear Regulation confirmed the plea and stated there was no evidence of exploitation or hacking. A sentencing hearing is set for August 8th. The charges involve not adequately protecting sensitive IT network information, though public safety was reportedly not compromised. Despite past media claims of Russian and Chinese hacker intrusions dating back to 2015, 
Sellafield asserts these issues only emerged when external staff accessed its servers and reported vulnerabilities. Sellafield's cybersecurity is now described as robust by its lawyers. Clearview AI settled an Illinois lawsuit alleging privacy violations from its photo database in a deal potentially exceeding $50 million. The settlement offers plaintiffs a share of the company's future value, with $20 million allocated for attorney fees. Preliminary approval was granted by Judge Sharon Johnson Coleman. The lawsuit, consolidating cases nationwide, claimed Clearview violated privacy by scraping photos from the Internet. Clearview previously settled a 2022 Illinois case, stopping sales to private entities but allowing work with law enforcement. Clearview denies liability in the current settlement. The agreement, facilitated by mediator Wayne Anderson, acknowledges Clearview's lack of funds for a larger payout. Privacy advocates criticize the deal for not stopping Clearview's practices. A campaign will notify eligible U.S. plaintiffs with data in Clearview's database from July 2017 onward. Researchers from Cyber Armor have uncovered a sophisticated malware campaign, Nikki, likely linked to North Korean hackers targeting aerospace and defense firms. This campaign uses job description lures to deliver a multi-stage attack, installing a powerful backdoor that provides remote access and data exfiltration capabilities. Indicators point to the Kim Suki group as the culprit. The back door employs advanced obfuscation techniques to evade detection. Coming up after the break, Rick Howard previews CSOP Live, and our guest is Christy Terrell, Chief Information Security Officer at Bishop Fox, discussing how organizations can best leverage offensive security tactics. Stay with us. When it comes to ensuring your company has top-notch security practices, things can get complicated fast. Vanta automates compliance for SOC 2, ISO 27001, HIPAA, and more, saving you time and money. With Vanta, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Quora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Our listeners can claim a special offer of $1,000 off Vanta at vanta.com slash cyber. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash cyber for $1,000 off Vanta. The IT world used to be simpler. You only had to secure and manage environments that you controlled. Then came new technologies and new ways to work. Now, employees, apps, and networks are everywhere. This means poor visibility, security gaps, and added risk. That's why Cloudflare created the first-ever connectivity cloud. Visit cloudflare.com to protect your business everywhere you do business. Christy Terrell is CISO at Bishop Fox. I recently caught up with her to discuss how organizations can best leverage offensive security tactics. Offensive security, which can be whittled down to you know more simple things like penetration testing, red teaming, those types of activities. Generally, people think of it as a more proactive, you know, we're going to do these things periodically, X number of times per year upon request. And it's all to find issues, you know, preferably before external parties and preferably before the bad guys find them. But what we're seeing is um, in a, as things have sped up and we do more ver- uh, frequent releases of apps and environments change, that these same types of activities are both needed more frequently 
And when there is some type of attack or incident or breach, it can actually complement how a company can respond to that. Hmm. Well, before we get into the recovery process a component here, can we talk about the, the frequency? I mean, how can an organization, as you say, in kind of this um, increased cadence, how do they dial in how often they should be doing these things? Well, the minimum bar has, has been for a long time and I think still is annual testing, right? Um, it's something that customers often require of the other B2B relationships. Um, and it's something that's in lots of policies and frameworks. But because things are changing so frequently, um, there, there is much more of a need to have results more frequently. And so the, the type of testing actually has to change. It can't just be a single point in time, comprehensive, deep dive, analyze all the source code, you know, look at it kind of clean slate. You can't do that every month, every quarter, even every week, right? So I think the type of testing services or testing activities you could do for yourselves internally needs to be more looking at incremental changes, looking at um, data fees you could even get from the outside, looking at things from like emerging threats, just more comprehensive, um, but also looking at things in smaller, chewable bites at once. And and how does this fit into a compliance regime here? I mean, you mentioned that you know, lots of folks are obligated to do something on an annual basis, but does this supplement that? Uh, yes. I mean, it's actually, it won't, I would say it might not help you with some of the compliance requirements because they're always a little behind the times and they still may have those kind of just do something annually, do something upon major release. But what you can do is whether you're working, you know, with a third party for that third party validation or doing some activities yourselves, you can still create and issue those types of reports that then at least say, you know, what was found at um, on what date and that you're fixing those things, right? Because let's just say you were doing testing that was once a quarter and your obligation is only annual. There's various ways you could do that for compliance, right? You can give them their most recent quarterly assessment. You could, you know, if something that's kind of an always on test, you could just get a point in time uh, report. So there's various ways. I mean, we've dealt with this with our customers because we've been um, definitely thinking about that. But there's various ways that you can still provide the assurance for compliance purposes that you're doing the activities that they want while actually being ahead of the curve and doing things you know, even more frequently and faster. And I suspect, uh, wouldn't it be so that uh, if you were doing these more frequently, when it comes time for that annual review, that it may help make that less of a heavy lift and, and maybe have there be fewer surprises. Absolutely. And typically for compliance purposes, the, what you do annually and what is usually provided by a third party that has a report and letter of assessment that goes with it is often what you're going to have to provide to your third parties and your own customers, right? And so, I mean, just from a, you know, point of pride perspective, you don't want to have a lot of things on that report. <laughs> you would prefer as an organization right. to identify and fix those earlier. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Well, let's talk about the recovery process component of this. I mean, how does it play into that? Right. So, you know, my own experience and also that of Bishop Fox, just to be clear, is that we don't do the immediate triage of incident. We don't do immediate incident response. So that's kind of not the perspective I have. It's just it's just not the services that we provide. But we often get engaged with our clients when they are in those follow-on days and weeks after an incident. And that's where we see how these services can be of help. So I just want to make that caveat clear. Typically, when we're when we're working with a customer, they've already been a previous customer of ours. They're not coming to us because they have a breach, right? We already have a relationship with them. We already have paperwork with them. So that's another kind of benefit of how we get to have a seat at the table to what they're what they're going through. But let me use an analogy. Let's say you have, and I live in New York City, so this analogy is at least very apt for myself. Let's say you live in an apartment building, um, and there is a fire in a single apartment. It's obviously the immediate need for the fire department is to come out and put that fire out, right? You don't want that fire to spread. You don't want anyone to get harmed. There's, you know, imminent time-sensitive things that have to happen. Immediately, you cannot wait and decide which fire department to call and you know, go through analysis. You just have to right. get, that, get that issue fixed. So let's say that gets fixed immediately. Fire is out. 
But often there's then a question of, well, is the apartment building safe for residents to come back in? You know, what was the cause of that fire? Was it because of a gas leak that could have, you know, could be an issue for the whole building? Was it a single incident? Was it, you know, was it isolated? So then there's actual work to be done of kind of going through methodically through the building, apartment by apartment, perhaps, to really check that the building is truly safe and secure before you can say everyone can move back in, right? So right. If, if you take that analogy, there's actually more work to be done in those kind of that gray area of you triage the actual immediate incident, but there's a lot more work you now have to do to make sure that that same incident won't happen again. That's Christy Terrell, Chief Information Security Officer at Bishop Fox. It is always a treat for me to welcome back to the show my N2K CyberWire colleague, Rick Howard. He is our Chief Security Officer, also our Chief Analyst. Rick, welcome back. Hey, Dave. So uh, you and I usually talk about CSO perspectives, uh, your very popular podcast here on the show. But this week, we've got something that's related, but a little different. Uh, What's coming up here, Rick? Yeah, this is one of my favorite things we get to do. Uh, It's called CSO Perspectives Live. It's a webinar about an hour long. All right. And you know, Dave, you do the news every day and it comes fast and furious. There's so many things (laughs) that happen, right? It's right. tough to get it's tough to get your hands around what's going on. So what this show does is it takes three uh well two experts and me. I was going to say three experts but <laughs> <laughs> right? uh and they pick a topic that uh, a news item that they think is going to have the most impact, you know, from the last 90 days and we can spend, you know, some time discussing the ramifications of it. So it's really fun to do and um uh, I love we get the opportunity to do it. Can you give us a little preview here? Who do you have lined up to be your experts? Yeah, these are two really old friends of mine. Uh, Don Capelli, she's the head of the OT cert for Dragos. Uh, she's an original OG uh, member of the Hash Table crew. Uh, and she's going to come in and talk about uh, Volt Typhoon and the Russian hacktivist attacks on water utilities and give us some details there. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of interviewing her a, a handful of times, and it's always... Time well spent. She's amazing, right? Really yeah. one of the smart people in the industry. And then right alongside her is Helen Patton, another old friend, another original hash table member. She's the cybersecurity executive advisor at Cisco. Um, but you know, I, I mention her all the time. She's working with me with the cybersecurity Canon project. She's on the board there. And she's bringing the, this topic that, man, I hadn't thought about this, but it was, I just started hearing inklings of it at the last RSA conference. It's, she calls it the changing role of security leadership. And what's been floating around is that maybe the CISO, that CISO job has become too big for one person. And maybe it's split into a technical role and a business role. And she's going to talk about the ramifications of that. That's intriguing. I know. I it's yeah. It's just, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Maybe I'm glad I'm at the end of my career. I don't have to mess with all that. <laughs> well, before I let you go, you mentioned the cybersecurity Canon project, and uh, you were just recently out that way at one of the the Canon events, right? Can you give us a little summary of your trip out? I believe it was Colorado, wasn't it? Yeah, I was at the Rocky Mountain Information Assurance Conference, and uh, we gave the Hall of Fame awards to the two winners this year. Um, Andy Greenberg uh, for his book, Tracers in the Dark, and uh, Dr. Eugene Spafford for his book, Myths and Misconceptions. And I can't tell you, Dave, what a fantastic job this is to be able to get on stage with those two brilliant people. I mean, Dr. Spafford, you know, he's one of the original um, cybersecurity founding fathers. Most of the things we think about now came from him, right? And and, and Andy Greenberg, you know, he is a world-class uh, cybersecurity journalist, been writing for Wired Magazine for almost a decade now. He's got two books in the Hall of Fame right now. And so, I mean, I just pinch myself sometimes they let me do stuff like this. <laughs> Isn't it great? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's the cybersecurity canon. So for, for folks who are interested in checking that out, just uh, search the regular places for cybersecurity canon. Yep, absolutely. Ohio State University is a sponsor. So just look up Canon. That's one N. 
and Ohio State University. You'll find it. And uh, there are book reviews for all the books we've considered for the Hall of Fame. So if you're looking to read a good book this year, don't read a bad one and take a look at the book reviews first and make your choice. And then signing up for CSO Perspectives Live, is that over on the CyberWire website? Yes, it is. Uh, go ahead and do that. You'll find it on the website. And it is, I'm make sure I got the date right, 27 June uh, at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. All right, terrific. Rick Howard is N2K CyberWire's Chief Security Officer and also our Chief Analyst. Rick, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Enterprises today are using hundreds of SaaS apps. Are you reaping their productivity and innovation benefits, or are you lost in the sprawl? Enter Savvy Security. They help you surface every SaaS app, identity, and risk, so you can shine a light on shadow IT and risky identities. Savvy monitors your entire SaaS attack surface to help you efficiently eliminate toxic risk combinations and prevent attacks. So go on, get savvy about SaaS and harness the productivity benefits. Fuel innovation while closing security gaps. Visit Savvy.Security to learn more. And finally, imagine finding a bug that literally fills your room with bugs. Well, that's exactly what happened with a new exploit researcher Ryan Pickren discovered in Vision OS Safari, running on Apple's Vision Pro headset. The bug allows a malicious website to bypass all warnings and fill your room with animated 3D objects like crawling spiders and screeching bats. When Apple announced the Vision Pro, they touted its impressive privacy protections but while exploring the technology, Ryan Pickren found an overlooked loophole in an old 3D model viewing standard. By using Apple's AR kit Quick Look, he could force Safari to spawn these objects without any user interaction. The kicker? These objects persist even after closing Safari. The exploit is simple. Using JavaScript to auto-click a hidden link, he could flood the victim's space with 3D models. Imagine hundreds of spiders crawling around your room with no easy way to get rid of them except by physically tapping each one. Ryan Pickren reported the bug to Apple, and they assigned it a CVE and paid him a bug bounty. The discovery highlights the need for a more nuanced approach to vulnerability triaging in the era of spatial computing. As we venture into hyper-realistic mixed reality, our threat models must evolve to consider the deeply personal nature of these devices. So, next time you find yourself donning the Vision Pro, beware of unexpected visitors. While virtual reality is designed to be immersive, nobody wants their home turned into a digital haunted house filled with virtual bugs and screeching bats. It's like an episode of Black Mirror, but with more spiders. Happy bug hunting. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. Your feedback ensures we deliver the insights that keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. If you like our show, please share a rating and review in your podcast app. Please also fill out the survey in the show notes or send an email to cyberwire at n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K CyberWire is part of the daily routine of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K makes it easy for companies to optimize your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your teams while making your teams smarter. Learn how at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Brandon Karp. Simone Petrella is our president. Peter Kilpie is our publisher. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow.
Attention all security professionals. Want real-time IP intelligence at your fingertips? Sign up for Scout Insights free trial today. Get immediate insights into threats, search any IP with no training required, and enjoy intuitive graphical results. Whether you need to identify compromised hosts or enrich Splunk queries, Scout Insight has you covered. Don't wait. Accelerate your threat response now. Visit teamcumry.com slash cyberwire to start your free trial. <laughs> 